Hi, everyone. Welcome to our training today. Uh, I'm Marissa Eck, and I am a behavior analyst for the Alice for Autism Foundation. And today we're going to be talking about something super, super important and super relevant to the current state of the world. Um, we're going to be talking about strategies for tolerating and wearing masks and face coverings. Here we go. So the learning objectives. Today, attendees will discuss general preventions informed by the CDC. Attendees will review the conceptual analysis of mask wearing behavior. Attendees will learn about two general procedures, shaping and desensitization. Attendees will gain an understanding of how to assess progress and program for independence. And before we continue, I just want to remind everyone that this course is eligible for CEU credits. So make sure you're paying attention. I'm going to give two secret code words throughout the presentation. Make sure to write them down, have them ready for when you submit for the course, and you will get one credit for this presentation. So where are we currently? Unfortunately, we are still experiencing a global pandemic. There is lots of uncertainty. Times are really scary. And it seems like we're getting new information that is contradictory to old information, and we're adapting to daily changes on the regular. And we're also just generally experiencing a new normal. And I feel like this image really <laughs> represents how it feels when you wake up every single day, checking your news feed on your phone or listening to the news and trying to adapt to what the new requirements are, where can you go, what kind of masks are okay, what kind of coverings are allowed, um, and how we can get ourselves comfortable with it, and mo most importantly, how can we get our learners to be comfortable with it? Because if this is the new normal, this isn't one of those things that we can just avoid and hope that will uh, it will pass. This might just be something we need to all be comfortable with, unfortunately, and um, get ourselves and get our learners ready and comfortable with this new normal. So here are the general preventative measures that I'm sure you've heard time and time again, but I do think it's important to have them in here. Wear a cloth face covering or a medical mask, whatever you have today. I have a combat COVID mask. I also have a N95 mask. I also have a face shield. Um, these are just the few that are, you know, um, allowed or a, a rather um, recommended by the CDC. Of course, stay at least six feet from other people and frequently wash your hands. Super important. Okay, so let's dive in now to what we're really looking at is how our learners are coping with having to wear masks. So this is something that I like to call the mask wearing compliance spectrum. We have the green light on our left, which is representing a learner who is potentially really afraid to wear a mask, will not wear it at all, um, and is engaging in some challenging behavior in the presentation of the mask, and there's been little to no success with tolerating it. Here we have in the middle what I like to call the yellow light, which are some learners who will wear it sometimes or for a short period of time or only will wear it um, when out in the community to a specific store maybe they were taught in or a specific environment like school, um, but is not always consistently compliant with wearing this mask. And then on our right, we have our green light, which is our learner who is willing to wear the mask um, and is not engaging in challenging behavior in the presence of the mask and is generally quite flexible with wearing it and where to wear it and understanding of those um, and understanding of those rules and is able to discriminate when it's okay and when it's not okay. So of course, it's always important to keep this in here because the things that we see, you'd be surprised guys. Um, but it's important to remember how to not wear a mask. Um, having it under your chin or having it just over your nose is not right, having it just over your mouth is not right. And remember, it needs to be covering your whole mouth and your nose like this. Um, and you know, there's different varying ways so it can go around your head. There's lots of modifications. People are very creative, thankfully, um, to make this easier for us and for our learners to make it comfortable and not feel so invasive on our space. Um, so that's just something that I think is important to remember. So let's dive into the nitty gritty from behavior analytic perspective. 
when we talk about a conceptual analysis, we're looking at that ABC dynamic of what happened before, what happened during, and what happened after. And specifically, we're looking at um, the conceptual analysis of mask wearing pre and post a procedure like shaping or descents. And we're going to talk more into that as we go along. So when a learner is presented with a mask and potentially in, is on that spectrum of red or yellow zone as far as tolerating it, we're looking at the antecedent. And the antecedent of that is that masks are aversive to the learner. For some reason, um, maybe there's some previous experience with wearing masks. Some of our learners have been in and out of hospitals. Some of, some of our learners have had to deal with a lot of medical procedures. And there may be some sort of association with the mask that it equals not so fun stuff. There's also a chance that the mask, without any successful wearing of it, um, it just might feel uncomfortable for some of our learners. It's super foreign to have something on your face all day. Um, and I mean, speaking from my experience, it took a lot of practice um, for me to be wearing it around, um, you know, out in the community and feeling okay about it, feeling like I could breathe properly, especially if you're someone who's a runner or someone who is wearing a mask all day long, teaching or um, working in a hospital as a essential worker. Um, it takes a lot of time to feel like it just belongs there and that it's okay and that you don't have to keep fussing with it or ripping it off because it's uncomfortable. So back to our learners. Masks are aversive to our learners for one reason or another. And I want you to think about that as we're continuing. You might be a parent, an educator, a therapist. So thinking of your child, thinking of your learners, um, are masks av aversive to that learner or to a group of learners? The presentation of mask elicit a strong emotional response and maybe some feelings about the mask, like we said. And this strong emotional response and feelings increase the value of removing that mask and, in, and then um, remove the value of the mask being a valuable reinforcer. The mask at this point is of no value in that it just represents that removing it is better than wearing it. So then the behavior, the learner engages in behaviors that have helped to remove the mask before. Could be ripping it off, could be screaming, crying, throwing themselves to the ground, um, you know, all of the above. Um, then we're also looking at our consequences. So in these situations for our learners who are in the red and yellow area of that tolerance spectrum, we're looking at what do we do as the adults around them to respond to these behaviors. So oftentimes the consequence is that we remove the task or proximity that strengthen that behavior and that will occur the next time the mask is introduced. So if we are putting a mask, we're saying, put on your mask, and the learner engages in tantruming or rips the mask off, and we say, okay, never mind. Then they've learned in that context, oh, if I just do this, um, the consequence is that I don't have to wear it. And this can be really delicate because it's a really difficult skill to kind of look at globally when you're like, wow, this is such a big undertaking. You know, it's on their face. You know, you don't want to be too invasive on a learner. But just remember what we reviewed earlier. This is super, super important, not just for us as the adults, but for our learners and for them to be in social situations, for them to be able to go back to school. Um, so as much as it feels like you're at the base of a mountain and you're like, wow, where, how are we going to get to them tolerating it for more than a second? Um, that's okay. This is breaking it down into attainable goals. So let's move forward to do that. So there are two general approaches that I'm going to be talking about today. We have systematic desensitization and shaping. And both of these procedures are evidence-based procedures that support um, slow and steady reinforcement of the approximation of the behavior that you're looking for, just in various different ways. So what is desensitization? Desensitization is the process to make someone non-reactive to a sensitizing agent. It diminishes the emotional responsiveness to a negative aversive, for example, person, place, or thing, that thing being the mask in this situation, after repeated exposure to it, right? So I give myself as an example in this, um, I actually had a really tough time swimming. Um, I had an accident when I was a kid in water and I always had a really hard time tolerating being near or in water even on family vacations and so my family thought it was really important for me to experience a desense procedure to get me to be okay 
with swimming. And it took a long time. I mean, I'm, you know, 28 years old and I definitely am just now feeling super, super comfortable with swimming on my own and not having someone there with me. Um, but it was a slow and steady process that I was willing to participate in because I really wanted to remove that discomfort around swimming because it can be such a positive experience. So that is just one example. We also have shaping. So shaping is a process in which a learner starts from one behavior and moves systematically across smaller steps towards a final form of the behavior. So I like to use this visual because I feel like it really encompasses what shaping is. So at the base, you're looking at the initial steps, the starting behavior. For me, it was getting into a pool or dipping my toe into the ocean. For this situation that we're discussing today, it might just be holding a mask, touching the mask, tolerating the mask on their face for three seconds. This is going to look different per client. But the starting point is where we are going to begin. Then we're going to be breaking it down into successive approximations and using differential reinforcement to reinforce those successive approximations. That might sound like complete nonsense to you, and that's okay. We're going to explain that as we go along. And the last step to shaping is reaching that target and terminal behavior. And for these purposes, that is tolerating a mask. That's what we're working on. So here are the general steps to shaping. We're going to be looking at first determining the goal, select and define target behavior. For the purposes today, we're going to be talking about um, mask wearing, but this is a procedure that is not specific to mask wearing, right? This is a procedure that can be used for a variety of different skills. Um, so keep that in mind as we're discussing. I love shaping as a procedure. I think it's one of those really, really beautiful um, procedures that kind of feels like a dance in that um, you start to learn it and then it gets better and then it gets better and then it gets better and then you're doing it and it's awesome. It can feel icky in phase one um, because it's super new and it's super hard. But as you start to get step two, step three, step four, and those steps are being reinforced, it starts to feel a little bit more fluid. So I'm getting ahead of myself here, I know. Can you tell I'm excited about shaping? <laughs> um, step two is pick a starting point. Select that initial starting behavior. Number three is make it fun and expose, use exposure. So you're gonna wanna select powerful reinforcers to pair up the masks and what you can deliver when those behaviors occur. And again, we're, break, we're gonna break this down further. This is just a general kind of representation of our steps. Then you're gonna be taking those baby steps, determine the incremental steps that will move you toward the target goal. And then the next step is reinforcement. Reinforce those successive approximations for the target behavior, reinforce target behavior continually, continuously, and then eventually you're gonna reinforce intermittently. We'll talk about what that means. And of course, we're gonna be talking about ensuring generalization and how important that is, especially for this skill. So step one. Determine the goal, select and define your target behavior, which is wearing a mask when socially distanced cannot be guaranteed, and also being able to wear it for long durations. Step two, you're gonna pick a starting point. Select and define the target behavior. So at baseline, you're gonna look at what can the learner do that might be a good starting point. So here are some versions of that that um, I want you to consider. Can they tolerate it? Can they tolerate others wearing it? Can they just look at it? Can they have it close, close by within six feet, three feet, a foot? Can they put it up close to their face? Can they wear it with some reminders? Hey dude, fix your mask. Or, oh, it's time to put your mask on. Can they wear it independently for short periods in familiar places? Can they wear it at home? Can they wear it independently for longer periods in familiar places? Can they wear it for up to a few hours at home? Can they wear it in public for short trips to the grocery store, to the pharmacy, to pick up something from the store, super quick trips? Can they wear it in public for longer durations or for the whole day? Or none of that's happening, we're not getting anywhere with this. If that's where you're at, that's okay, you're in the right place. But those other steps are worth considering too, because we have learners who are kind of all over the place with mask wearing and that's okay, because no learner is the same, that's for sure. So we're going to look at that conceptual analysis that we were talking about earlier and break that down into how, can, how are we going to use desense and shaping 
to change that conceptual analysis that we had prior to um, training our learners to tolerate wearing a mask. So right, in an, the antecedent column, we have masks are aversive for the learner. So with shaping and descents, we want to make masks fun and not scary. Presentation of the mask elicits a strong emotional response and feelings. We want to make masks elicit a positive emotion and eventually just a general neutral emotion. But first, we want to start positive. This strong emotional response and feelings increase the value of removing the mask. It is not a valuable reinforcer, right? So because after descents and shaping, because it does not generate a strong aversive emotion, there's no need to escape from it. That's where that's the goal we want to get to. So in the behavior column, the learner is engaging in behaviors that help to remove the mask. And our steps within shaping and descents is approach, wear, and tolerate. Those are the things we're going to be focusing on. Will they approach it? How long will they wear it? How long will they tolerate it throughout the day? What's, what's their duration? We're going to be focusing on working systematically through those steps. And consequence, of course, we're no longer going to be removing it in the presence of challenging behavior because we're going to try really hard proactively to reduce challenging behavior with the procedures we're going to talk about. And those include heavy, heavy positive reinforcement. So I, I know that was a lot, but I really hope that that makes a lot of sense for you guys. And before I continue, I'm going to give you your first secret code word, which is Banana. I repeat, your first secret code word for CEU credits is banana. One more time, your secret code word is banana. All right, let's continue. So our next step that we're going to cover is how to make it fun and increase exposure. So the following is not an exhaustive list, meaning there are a lot of ways that you can do this. These are just the ways that I'm going to recommend from a behavior analytic perspective. So just keeping that in mind. So these are some general strategies to make mask wearing less aversive by using descents and moving the learners towards being able to wear the masks with shaping. Strategies, of course, can be more individualistic to each learner and those people, places, or things that are fun and reinforcing for them. So making it fun allow for choices. Think of how important it is every day when you wake up every morning and you have choices of what you can wear, choices of what you can eat, choices of what how you want to take your drive to work, what you want to listen to. All these choices come for free. A lot of the time our learners are given less choices because there is a time crunch and we have to just do it for them, or we already know what they like, right? So we're just gonna go with that. And unfortunately, I'm gonna say with mask wearing, that's not gonna work. Um, I want to make sure that we keep in mind that our learners need opportunities to have autonomy. And this is a good place to be with it. It's thinking about what they like. If mask wearing is super hard, this is a really good place to start because they can help be part of the process of developing um, the masks that they wear. So especially these cloth masks, I mean, there are just so many awesome cloth masks right now. Um, but there's also special companies that are making really cool adaptations for our learners and for people who work in schools where it's like clear, but there's also the tightness around the nose. So all those things are uh, really awesome and, and it's amazing how creative everyone is, is, has been to um, make this workable. So from the outset, make sure that the learner is part of the decision-making process of what type of mask they like to wear. Of course, keeping in mind it needs to meet CDC requirements, which I'm sure by the time that this presentation is out, that might change a few times. Um, but I know for, for sure it has to cover your mouth, it has to cover your nose, and it's really important for it to be tighter around your nose um, to avoid any fogging, especially if you have glasses, and to just avoid any airflow from outside of your mouth and your nose. Allow them to choose, allow them to choose based off of their favorite color, favorite character, favorite sports, favorite animals, or maybe designing their own. Making it fun by modeling. This is super fun and a really effective way to kind of expose our learners without it feeling too invasive. 
So it can be helpful to model, expose, and practice appropriate mask wearing with your learner in a variety of ways. So there's preferred toys or preferred dolls. So here we have an image of Elmo wearing an Elmo mask, which is very meta. Um, we also have a teddy bear in this picture who's wearing a mask. Um, wearing, having teachers or therapists or parents wear masks when they're FaceTiming or Zooming, um, you know, putting it on your pet for <laughs> in a safe way or keeping your pet available as a comfort. And then of course, with family and friends, the more people around our learners that are wearing masks, um, it's going to increase their, both their generaliz generalization skills, but also their tolerating um, because it starts to norm be normalized around them. Make it fun with where and when. Again, generalization is key. So wearing these masks in different places, wearing it with different people, and wearing it during really fun activities can be really helpful because, again, it normalizes it. Um, and it also is then uh, desensitizing them to how it feels on their face because it's just being presented throughout a variety of activities and isn't consistently always like when we go to school, we wear a mask or when we're in the store, we wear a mask and those are the only places we wear masks. Um, that can be helpful for some learners who are rule governed, but for our learners who might be younger or having a really hard time with tolerating this mask, even as a first step, um, I think it's really important to do it in different places. Here we have a picture of adults at the beach and we have people um, getting off the school bus and we have them playing sports, playing on a preferred scooter or waiting in line at the grocery store, um, wearing it across environments and with different people and during those fun activities will promote generalization because the worst thing that can happen is we teach a learner to tolerate wearing a mask in one place with one person doing one thing it can be really really hard to then get them to tolerate shifting from that um, that routine um, and the goal is for our learners to be able to wear it across the board to increase their avail availability to go out into the world and to be around others safely so we're also going to talk about how to make it fun with games and play. So games are a great way to make mask wearing fun and to help remove the aversion around wearing them. So some games that I've played with learners is who can wear it the longest, make it competitive and silly, um, putting masks on others. There's a game, a really beautiful game that's been created. I'm pretty sure it's on Boom Learning um, or Boom Cards where you can practice putting masks on different characters and kind of making it silly of like, oh, is, is this where my mask goes? Is this where it goes? Um, and really turning it into like a discrimination activity, but really making it fun and engaging. Um, role playing as doctors and superheroes. Um, you know, I think it's a really awesome opportunity to kind of create your own superhero um, and kind of make it a classroom thing, make it something contingent that's at home. Um, you know, there's a lot of flexibility with, with learners of how you want to implement this. And of course, there's always good old Simon Says to practice it as well. Um, there's also different rewards that you can put in place. Um, this was an award that was created by a teacher that's the Mask Master Award. Um, and that can be given out to different learners at the end of the day. And that can kind of shape up their behavior in the presence of the mask because they're excited and they're feeling praised. There's lots and lots of heavy reinforcement being given for wearing the mask. Again, really important to remember that this is all about baby steps. We are not going to start with a learner not knowing how to do something, um, and being really aversive to it to the next day, wearing it and having no qualms about it whatsoever. <laughs> um, in a perfect world, perhaps, but let's be realistic and let's set our kiddos up for success. So in this step, we're talking about baby steps. So again, each learner will be at a different starting point. Each learner will have the same end point, right? The end point is wearing a mask, just tolerating it and being able to wear it across places, across people and across activities. Moving from start to finish is going to look different for each learner. Um, I think this is especially important right now as parents are kind of communicating at a rapid rate. What is your kid doing? What is your kid doing? And teachers are, you know, feeling concerned about, um, you know, the progress of each of their learners. You know, I think that we care so much and we want to make sure that our learners are set up for success, but um, that comparison syndrome can be really tough to navigate. So 
just remember that moving from start to finish is not going to be black and white for all of our kiddos. Some may move really slow, some may move somewhere in the middle, and some may just be able to tolerate it after a few attempts. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything about our kiddos. It just means that we have to be creative with how we're teaching it. And sometimes, again, steps need to be broken down into small, manageable steps for both the learner and the caregivers doing it, caregivers or therapists and teachers. So when we're breaking it down, we're going to be talking about what shaping is, right? So when you're breaking it down to those attainable, small little goals that lead to the terminal goal. So here, we're talking about an example, an example one, which would be on when you're looking at the mass tolerating spectrum, this is like a red light, right? This is a kiddo who screams and cries when the mask is even out, when their parent is wearing it in a different room, um, will not tolerate it within their space at all. So <clears throat> here we have it broken down into, you know, 11 steps. And this, even this can be broken down even to more steps, even more punitively. Um, so just keeping that in mind, this is just an example. So we have step one, seize the mask from across the room. So we would teach them, we would provide reinforcement for step one. Maybe we would create criterion for mastery of two sessions successful for at 100%. And then we would be able to move on to step two. What's important to remember about shaping is that you never go backwards. You're always gonna keep moving forward. And if it's a tough day, just stay at that step that you were at and that's okay. But you're not going to provide reinforcement for a step that's already been mastered. So in this case, if a learner tolerates and masters step one within you know, the first week, in week two, it sees it from six feet away. If they tolerate it from six feet away, reinforcement is provided. If they have a hard time with it, that's okay. We're gonna stay at step two and we're gonna work through it, but we're not gonna go backwards and move it further away from them. That's the benefit of shaping is that you're always moving forward. And you're gonna, if the learner is having a hard time with six feet away, you can increase it to 10 feet away, as long as the expectation is higher, a little bit higher, even just a smidge higher than step one. So then um, we move on to see it from three feet away, sees it from one foot away, has it in their proximity. Maybe it's just sitting on their desk, sitting on a, a big table, can tolerate touching it briefly, can tolerate it on their lap, can tolerate holding it, can tolerate putting up to their face and putting it down, can tolerate putting up to face for five seconds, and you're gonna to continue toward the goal. So the next step could be tolerate putting up to face for 10 seconds, 30 seconds, a minute, tolerates one loop around the ear, tolerates two loops around the ear, um, tolerates wearing it for one minute with both loops around the ear. This would be broken down much, much longer for teaching purposes. This is just our first example. Then we have example number two, which is somewhere in like the middle ground with tolerating it. So my learner is not afraid of the mask. They don't care about the mask necessarily. They're not having a big reaction to the presentation of it. Um, it doesn't necessarily have any associations with anything negative. However, they do refuse to wear it. So here in our second example, we have a learner who verbally refuses when asked to put on a mask. So here, you know, is just a broken down shaping procedure. And again, this is just an example. It can be broken down even further. But this is for those learners who are not afraid of the mask, like I said, but are refusing to wear it. So the first step would be tolerates on face for five seconds, tolerates on face for 10 seconds, tolerates on face for 20, 30, one minute, three minutes, and so on. And these are for those learners that, um, you know, again, aren't necessarily afraid or averse to the mask existing in space near them, but are having a really hard time tolerating it on their face. Okay, and then in our third example, we hear um, sometimes my child will wear it, but not for a long time. So that might be they'll wear it for one minute, um, and that's a really good place to be. So, I, you know, when I hear that, I'm like, great, we can absolutely work with that. Um, but I also know that that's not the case for everyone, and we can work with that too. Um, but don't, you know, for parents out there, don't be so hard on yourself if your learner won't wear it for more than a minute. That's a great place to be. So in this situation, um, a learner, you know, like this example, will wear it for one minute before trying to pull it off. So what we're going to do is shape by duration. So we're gonna increase it by a minute or two minutes each time, 
depending on what the ultimate goal is. It might be wearing it for an entire session, which can be 30 minutes, two hours, whatever that is, or wearing it for the entire school day or trip to the store. Um, whatever that is, the goal is going to be continued toward using a shaping with by duration. Um, and just a reminder, with shaping, once you master that initial step, you're not going to go backwards. You're just going to be reinforcing where you currently are and where you're going to be moving forward to. And remember, everyone moves at their own pace. This is true about everyone. Um, I always think of shaping as the example of like learning how to run a marathon. You don't just decide to wake up one day and say, I'm going to run a marathon. You are going to hurt yourself and you're going to fail. And that's okay. Um, running 26 and a half miles is not an easy feat. So with shaping in that sense, you're going to wake up the next day and you're going to walk for 10 minutes. And then you're going to wake up the next day and walk for 15 minutes. And then maybe at the end of the week, you're going to jog for one minute. Um, and then you're just going to slowly increase the approximation in which that you're engaging in. And maybe after six months, three months, six months, a year, what, two years, whatever it is, maybe you're going to reach that terminal goal of running a full marathon. But remember, everyone moves at their own pace. If I were to be training to run a marathon, I am not a runner. It would take me a full year, but maybe my partner who is a runner, um, it might take him three months. So again, this is just thinking of it on our grand scheme in our own lives. Remember that everyone moves at their own pace. Our learners are going to move at their own pace as well. So step four, reinforce movement forwards. We are always going to be thinking about that. Remember, I'm going to highlight it again. We are not going to be reinforcing steps that we've already mastered, we're moving forward. So reinforcement should be provided for engaging in the current step. When the current step meets a determined criteria, for example, three consecutive times at that step, you're gonna move on to the next step. You're gonna stop reinforcing the previous step. I know this is redundant, we did go over this, but I think it's important to remember. Then you're gonna provide reinforcement for the new step. Try to have big ticket items or reinforcers for those successive steps. It's really important to remember that these skills, especially mask wearing, is hard. So saving something that's super, super special um, for them to be earning for those successful steps, successive steps um, is going to really up the value of being able to wear a mask for these learners. If stuck, drop back if needed to the current step into a previous successful step, but you're going to downgrade the reinforcement in that position, right? So if you know, if your learner has mastered tolerating it for uh, in their hand, but they're having a tough day and there might be other stuff going on, you're still going to want to provide reinforcement for them tolerating it, but just in the absence of challenging behavior. Um, and you might want to downgrade the value of your reinforcement. So if they're going to be moving successively, you're going to be throwing them a party. You're going to be having a stark contrast to um, the previous step to now. And that's really important for our learners because they're so sensitive to what we're saying, what we're doing, what they're getting, what they're avoiding. Um, so in this situation, there should be a stark contrast for when you're super, super excited because they're moving forward or if they're having a tough day, that's okay. Um, but remember, there should be a contrast in your reinforcement. And as always, practice as much as possible. This doesn't need to be something that you sit and do at a table. This doesn't need to be something that you do for long periods of time. I would suggest doing shaping in little sprints, three minutes this hour, three minutes during this hour, 30 seconds if you can, it's okay. The expectation for running a shaping procedure isn't to be sitting at a desk and to be running it for a full hour session. Um, you can, if that's something you're comfortable with, but my recommendation is to do it in short little sprints, make it attainable, and uh, keep behavioral momentum high. And of course, end the day on the high note. If your learner is having a little bit of a tough day, try to end on a high note, end there, and move on tomorrow. It's okay. Shaping is definitely one of those things that is not a race. Um, it is not a sprint by any means. It is a marathon, full circle with that analogy, I guess. Um, it is very much so. You want to end on a high note so that you, as the caregiver, parent, teacher, therapist, are also reinforced by the procedure of using shaping. You want to see it be successful for your learner so that you're more likely to keep going. You don't want to throw in the towel with shaping and say, oh, this isn't working. Nope, let's just reevaluate and see where we can make some tweaks to make this work for, for our learners and for the people working with them. Step five, 
number one. Vary who they are with. Again, this is going to be varying by people. Vary where they are. Vary the location. Vary those activities taking place. And vary the mask options. Um, I think that can be really important, not necessarily always for the learner. It, it's going to be great to practice them tolerating a bunch of different types of masks. Like me, I have a cloth. I have a face shield. I have my N95. Um, and I have a bunch of others at home. But what also is important is to expose them to you wearing a bunch of different masks because we don't want our learners to get used to us wearing one kind of mask because what if we lose that mask? What if it gets dirty? What if we just want to wear a new one? Um, so kind of embedding those flexibility opportunities is important to both for the learner tolerating wearing novel masks, but also them tolerating you wearing different masks too. Okay, so how do we tra track progress with shaping? and pay attention to where it's going. So you're going to want to track it one way or another. You can use a graph, you can use different visuals that work for you. You can just write down what step they're on, whatever is makes the most sense and is easiest for you. Um, it is really important to keep track so that you can decide when to move on to the next step. And you need to keep track of that criteria that you've set. Um, and it'll help you decide when you need to try a different technique. If you're stuck at step two and you're stuck there for two weeks, and you're racking your brain, it's time to come back to the drawing board and reevaluate. Maybe we need to change the expectation a little bit, break it down a little bit further. None of that means failure. It just means that we need to just be creative with how we're teaching it. Here is an example of data collection. <clears throat> the current goal is where's it for one minute? You know, they meet, they, um, meet criteria um, and then we would increase the goal to you know they wear it for five out of five opportunities five out of six opportunities five out of seven opportunities five out of eight opportunities and you're just going to increase the opportunities throughout the day and then you're also increasing um, the duration and that's just you know one example of many many versions of this it's also super super important and because I want you to pay very close attention to what I'm talking about in this slide, is I'm going to give you your other secret code word right now. So your other sticky, your other, oh, I just gave it away. Your other secret code word is sticky. S-T-I-C-K-Y, sticky, sticky fingers. Um, and I'm telling you that because this slide is super, super important. You cannot expect to teach a child to tolerate something if you don't also teach them how to ask for its removal, um, or how to communicate their needs in tandem with that. Um, in, if you are doing it that way, you are in a way withholding an opportunity for autonomy. So think about teaching autonomy with functional language. So in step one, what we're thinking about is you wanna teach learners to ask if they can remove the mask to replace challenging behavior, especially during meals, drinking and arriving back home. For our learners who are vocal verbal, teaching them how to vocally say it. For our loner, learners who are non-vocal verbal and are using AAC device, sign, PEX, whatever version or modality of communication, you want to make sure that you are teaching them to ask to take it off. Um, for our learners who are just learning to wear it, this might be something you practice back and forth in a discrete trial way. They wear it, they ask to take it off. Sure, you can take it off. Great job telling me. Great job using your words, asking me to take it off. Um, and teaching them the space around um, in which they can take it off. So in some examples, there might be rooms in classrooms that are um, available to take off the mask because there are no other kids in the room, or just going outside and taking a mask break and being able to mand and request for those things is super, super important in teaching our learners, if this is our new normal, how to have that autonomy with what is on their body and when, when and if they're uncomfortable. Like, I'm going to highlight now. So teaching learners to ask to take it off if it's uncomfortable, if it's painful. I know, speaking from my experience, wearing a mask all day outside of right now because I'm in an empty office. Um, but if someone were in here with me, which there oftentimes is, is we are wearing our masks all day. Um, and it can bother behind your ears. It can bother your neck, especially if you're sensory defensive and have some, you know, a hard time tolerating things like that. It can feel heightened. Um, and for some of our learners, instead of asking to take it off or using appropriate language, they're going to engage in challenging behavior to get the removal of that because the motivation to remove it is really high. So always keep that in mind. Just telling our learner, wear your mask without taking these things into account isn't fair. 
Number three, teach learners to communicate if they need a break from wearing it. Like I said, have designated spaces where they can do that, have them be able to go walk through go outside, go for a walk, take it off, go into a bathroom stall if there's no one else in there. It's really going to depend on the regulations of your state and the regulations of where you are. Um, but always plan ahead in that way, expecting our learners to keep it on all the time without being able to remit, remove it off again is a really, really high expectation and isn't necessarily, um, doesn't necessarily need to be the case. And again, Number four is really helpful. I always want to encourage people to use visuals. So use a visual to indicate if masks can be off or need to be on. So something that I always want to recommend is using something like a multiple scheduler, like a red green system where, and this visual can be anything. It can be a banana. It could be a picture of the mask. It could be a picture of the mask with one of the like no smoking signs over it um, to signal is it okay? Am, am I expected to wear my mask here or can I take it off? Um, for our learners who are learning how to learn, this is going to be a really great method for you to implement um, and can be taught really quickly, not in the sense of they learn it quickly, but you can do it quickly throughout your sessions and kind of do it in those sprints. Um, in the presence of this, you wear it. Oh, I flipped it over. You can take it off. Nice job. Um, kind of practicing it in that so that the learner is understanding and discriminating the presence of the stimuli and also the action which you're expecting them to do. Again, the stimuli don't particularly matter. I like to use a red-green system, like green means yes, red means no, green means uh, go, red means stop, whatever that is. Um, but it doesn't necessarily matter. What matters is how you teach it and the consequences in which that are put in place in the presence of those stimuli. So just keep that in mind. If you don't have access to a red-green card, think of other things that can be fun functional for your learner. Could be a picture of a mask, could be a picture of no mask really be creative with it, but um, I highly recommend using something like that, especially for our learners who are learning how to learn. And here are summary and takeaway points. Practice, practice, practice. Remember that each learner is different. Practice, practice, practice. Some, some steps may take longer than others. That's okay. That's actually more common than it's not. Um, steps are going, certain steps that are the um, response effort is higher. You're, it might take a little bit longer and that's totally okay. Stick to it. The terminal goal remains the same. We may need to break things down a little bit more, but that just means that we're getting creative and we're trying our best to set up our learners for success. Again, practice, always practice, and then reinforcement is key in moving forward. If you're working with a learner and they are not coming in contact with reinforcement for the successive steps in which you're trying to get to, you're going to have a hard time seeing um, them tolerate this mask or tolerate any situation in which they are not feeling comfortable with. I'm just turning my walkie-talkie off. Sorry about that. Um, again, practice, practice, practice. Um, and those are the points that I think are super important. I think, I hope that you guys know that one of the biggest things to take away is just practice. Here's our conclusion. Um, we talked about shaping and desensitization and how you don't necessarily need to just pick one to do. Um, you can do them in conjunction with, with each other and that would be great. Um, determine your goal. Pick the goal that you want to work on. In this case, we're talking about masks, but this can be used for anything. Um, I was talking to a colleague recently and we were discussing how we did this for a learner to tolerate a medical procedure, like getting a, um, a cleaning, or you can use it for a learner to tolerate taking medication because that can be really tough. Getting a haircut, um, walking down the hallway without engaging in elopement. I mean, shaping is one of those super powerful tools that you can use I think it's one of the best things you can have in your toolbox as a behavior analyst, as a parent, as a therapist, as a teacher, all of the above. Um, so keeping in mind that shaping and descents don't need to be separate and they can be used when you determine your goal and pick your starting point. Consider your case conceptualization. Prior to implementing shaping and descents, break it down. Look at the ABC. See what happens um, before during and after. What is it that we're doing as the adults? Are we mediating this? Are we, you know, giving into this behavior? Um, what is it removing for us? Are we, would we rather not see our learner uncomfortable so we're quick to take it off? How can we fix that? How can we work through that? Of course, super exciting. Make it fun and use expose, exposure. Um, 
make it fun with exposure is super, super important because the more normal um, we make practicing wearing masks and where we talk about it, um, the more we make it a little bit more passive and less like this big looming, oh, it's mask time. Um, I think it'll feel a little bit more natural and feel a little bit less pressure for our learners. Remember that we're doing this in baby steps, that reinforcement is extremely important and always, always, always program for generalization or plan for generalization. These are my references and thank you. Um, again, my name is Marissa Eck. I am a behavior analyst for Ells for Autism. Um, please feel free to email me with any questions and I really hope you wrote down those secret code words that you get your CEU credits. Um, I'm looking forward to many future trainings, but I know this one was super, super important considering where we're at in the world. Um, I hope everyone is healthy and safe and having um, a good time kind of navigating the new normal. Um, Thank you so much for coming today and I look forward to hearing from some of you guys and I hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thank you.